Thanks very much. I'm really surprised anybody's here. I mean, there's great theater happening on CNN right now. Anybody been listening besides us? No? For five minutes. The Cohen, the Michael Cohen thing. And uh, yeah, I almost didn't come to my own talk. But <laughs> what's fascinating, besides the substance, which you can all read, is the visuals. On the one hand, we have a bunch of white men with parts in their hair doing ad hominems at Michael Cohen. On the other hand, the people defending him are women, are black folks, are Jewish folks, and are somebody with an East Coast accent. I, I heard it on radio. In other words, it's a two America kind of dynamic visually going on. It's, it's, it, it was incredible. Having said that, I'm going to talk about something totally different. But I had to share that with you, and I was hopefully that somebody else had similar perspectives. Um, I work with a whole bunch of people. Really, what, what I do, yeah, I'm, I'm nominally at Ryerson University, but I run something called the NetLab Network, which are people doing social network analysis uh, one way or another. And Professor Annabel Kwan Hasse uh, is, is my key partner. Two doctoral students, Molly Harper and Alice Zhang, and Helen Wang, who's a faculty member at, at Buffalo in communications. Uh, anybody here from communications? Yeah, so you, maybe you know uh, uh, Helen Hua Wang. And we, we've been working with, with others uh, for quite a while. Let's see, can I get this to work? Yes. So what I'm going to do is do a little bit of background. I, I expect I have until 12 o'clock. Is that? No, well, no. I haven't. Yeah, we usually go about an hour and 15 Yeah, OK. But we start a couple minutes late. Yeah, OK. So let I'll talk about some of the stuff I've been writing about, mostly in the book called Network, which came out too long ago, about eight years ago, and Fears of Community. But I will try to cut that as fairly short and talk about some of the findings we've come up with in the fourth East York study. East York, by the way, is part of Toronto, Canada. It has nothing to do with New York, except uh, York was the original name of, of, of Toronto. And, uh, under British uh, rule. We all know that community was originally supposedly a densely knit network. Keith Hampton, my former student and, and distinguished colleague now at Michigan State, uh, made up this slide in which everybody knew each other, talked to each other. You're all sociology. What do I have? Soci sociology students or, or faculty? Sociology. Any information studies people? couple. And so I'll skip most of the sociology Political stuff. Science. Political science. But he, he's a closet sociologist, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's been a recurrent fear forever saying that uh, things are falling apart. Uh, this statue, which was paid for by the British rock star Tommy Steele, uh, comes out of the Eleanor Rigby storm. And Keith Hampton and I have a nice paper. It appeared in Contemporary Sociology, which nobody seems to have read. So go read it, April 20, or maybe they read it and didn't like it, uh, 2018. Uh, talking about every generation thinks that things are falling apart. But everybody has a different uh, bete noir. Uh, is it industrialization, bureaucratization? Is it the evils of capitalism, the evils of sociology, of socialism? Is it now it's uh, mobile phones. Uh, Jane Twing at, uh, where is she? Somewhere in, in UC San Diego has been claiming that. Um, Vance Packard used to say it was cars. Bob Putnam said it was TV. Um, they don't have much data about it, but it, it goes way back to 1377, <laughs> where we found the first uh, quote about it. Um, Basically, the argument is, is this move from tribal life to urban life, things have gone weaker, and people aren't talking to each other. And, and if you want to come here, Thomas Jefferson, or as we in Canada call him, that evil rebel, uh, talked about how big cities were making things fall apart. Any Canadians here? You're Tam, you're sort of. Partially quasi-Canadian. 
Uh, and it's just been a recurrent theme. Uh, hi, Catherine. I'm just warming up, so you didn't miss much. Um, once again, read our article in the Contemporary Sociology, or read uh, the article that's coming out in the book by Brian Loader and Leah Livrell. And I, Joe has the slides, and at the end of the slides is all the references to this stuff. So you can, you can actually get the, the details uh, there. And now the moral panic is about digital media. Sherry Turkle is probably the most infamous one about that. She followed her teenage daughter around and mistook teenage angst for the world falling apart and wrote a book that was widely quoted called Alone Together. Bob Putnam got a lot of things right, but he, as an institutional political scientist, he focused on the declines of clubs and formal organization, and he missed the, the rise of networks and digital media. Um, he would have been Al Gore's domestic advisor, I'm told, if, if the election had been counted right way back then, but it, it wasn't. So I'm trying in our research, in our team's research, to avoid some fallacies. One is punditry. People make common sense deductive pronouncements. Actually, a little bit less here than in Toronto, but people walk around with their heads in here, and the deductive pronouncement is they're not seeing the world around them. But what are they doing? They're almost always communicating with somebody else in here. One thing that computer scientists do is do uh, presentism. They assume that only what's happened now is the only relevant uh, phenomena going on. So the people are seeing communities are, are are far flung now, and they ignore the fact that there's a good deal of data uh, assembled by folks like Chuck Tilley, um, Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie, saying that there's been a fair amount of communities going on uh, that are dis dispersed in the past. And computer scientists who I speak with a lot essentially saying that only what happens on the internet is the only thing that's relevant. So we will get community studies based only on what's happening on Facebook which is kind of silly. Most of my best friends, like Joe here, it's my today's best friend, um, are not on Facebook. Catherine's on a bit, and that's great. But most of my people I know on Facebook, Catherine accepted, are, are pretty weak ties. So it's kind of strange to, to pick up on that. What Lee Rainey, who's the co-author of my network book, and I, Lee heads the Internet and American Life Project, which is about the best source of reliable data on, on the Internet, thought about is three big changes were happening, and these are not the only changes in the world. One is uh, that there's been a turn from tightly knit groups to social networks to the growth of the Internet. We can distance definitely, but Something not much commented on is personalization, the fact that you can talk one-to-one, -one, whereas in the old days, telephones came to the house. Anybody here have, still have a landline, a wired phone? Anybody under the age of 40 have a landline here? Oh, you're under 40. Okay. Uh, we actually do in Toronto as well. We find it a little bit easier for us to talk collectivity. But we now have personal communication devices. We don't write letters, things like that. And, and of course, our devices are mobile. We've all pretty well learned to shut off our phones when we're in public spaces, but they've become personal appendages. It means you're always available whether you like to or not. So Lee and I called this, and at the same time, Manuel Castells was coming up with similar concepts as networked individualism. And the notion is that we, we are not alone. That's the network part. But the individual is now the point of connection instead of the household, instead of uh, staying in one little family group or one or two family groups. And the ties are, are somewhat cross-cutting, but, but pretty loosely bounded, and people have specialized relationships. However, having said all that, um, in fact, I'll move on to the next one. The real question, no one has ever identified the extent to which networked individualism e existed. And as I invented the term, I think Lee would agree, 
you know, I decided to find out whether I'm just making it up or things are going right. We found over 4,000 sites to this term when I looked up in Google so Scholar recently. You can, Joe can get out of his laptop and, and double check me. But just because a society is becoming networked, that doesn't mean that all have become networked individuals. Some may be still in traditionally bounded communities. They're called Republicans. And some may be relative isolates with, with few ties. So we went out and did the fourth Easter egg study. I've been doing this stuff since 1967. Uh, the first uh, study, when I was just out of grad school, basically documented the existence of supportive networks in non-local communities. The second study, uh, with data collected in 1979, um, was who gave what kinds of supports. And that we're, we're still playing with those concepts. Third one played with networked individualism a little bit. And now, with data collected in 2014, uh, we're looking at how does digital media fit, media fit in with social connectivity? And we've done this. This is East York, which is an area in Toronto. It's summertime there, or maybe last week in Tucson. <laughs> I was Trump. We didn't go out. When that snow I came with my bathing suit. You know. It was unusual. Yeah, they tell me that everywhere I go. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's a working class area. You can see the small homes. This picture is about 10 years old. So uh, the m cars are a bit old fashioned, but the same, you know, small cars and high rise apartments. It's set in Toronto, which is here, across the uh, Lake, Lake Ontario from Buffalo. Um, and anybody been in Toronto? Those few of you, Toronto's downtown is here. And this is a half hour subway ride. Subways are streetcars, except they go underground, um, or car ride from the downtown. It's Toronto itself, the metro area is about 6 million people right now. So basically the size of Phoenix, but a much more transit oriented uh, kind of city. Questions on context at all? Or? Anyway, and who lives there? I guess I didn't go into that. A uh, random sample of East Yorkers. I, I got tired of doing surveys. I've done a lot of surveys. So we went out, trained a bunch of uh, sociology students, uh, did interviews. With, we aimed for 100, but we got 101. Unfortunately, or fortunately, they were skewed upwards in age, partially the demographics of East York because the homes are small. Uh, they don't get large emerging families there. So 40% were over 65. We only had uh, non-frail English speakers. About 50% of Toronto has been born outside of the country. So there are a lot of people who don't speak, well, they speak some English, but some people don't speak any, often family reunification situations. We, we tape recorded it, we transcribed it. Um, one funny thing we didn't realize until we looked at the findings is because we used student interviewers and because we were transcribing it with, with computers, no, I'm sorry, we, la we taped it, but, beca but because these were student interviewers, the older adults got very finicky to say, well, you know more about computers than I do. They were very self-deprecating about, I'm sorry, you people there, I'm, I'm tilted this way. I, I apologize. Um, they're very self-deprecating about their own computer skills. And um, Annabelle and I and a few of our colleagues have a paper, too, about that kind of thing. Then we did a lot of thematic analysis. Uh, most of our written papers, and we have about six out now, are qualitative. But today, I only have time f for numbers. The sample was multicultural, very, almost no black people, but some Asian Canadians and people from ethnic origins almost every part of Europe, which is basically what Easter Rock has. OK, so um, 
We know from US data, just to digress and put in context, that almost everybody is getting to be online. But of course, and I'll, I hate these titles. This is the Pew's title, The Silent Era. I'm 76, so it really annoys me. I don't know about you, Joe, but I was out there fighting for civil rights. I wasn't very, since I know Bev was too. We're still not silent. We're still not silent. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we got out and worked to save democracy in the last US election. We're dual citizens, by the way. We were born in New York City and, and uh, Canadian citizens as well as American. And so we did a lot of work around the Buffalo area trying to bring some sanity in the world, which sort of worked. Uh, anyway, so older people have been less likely to be on. But now going back to East York, we find that we ask them what media they use, because I never want to put uh, stuff in context. And face-to-face -face communication, believe it or not, is still very important. And phone stuff is still very important. Um, and people, as you'll see, a recurrent theme that we have is older adults, when we did the study in 2014, remember that's five, oh, you know, four and a half years ago, so the world changes a lot in internet studies, were mostly reliant on email and to a little extent on Facebook and Skype. Uh, you can imagine what they would use those for, especially to keep track of their grandchildren. Or remember, in East York is multicultural, so people living in China or living in Portugal uh, to have Skype conversations with them. There was a variation in skills as well. Um, most of them rated themselves as, and this was self-reported, as, as low to middling skills. Um, and they only used one or two things, email almost always, and Facebook or just Google searching uh, going on. So one possibility would be this. This is the updated version of, of Whistler's mother. Um, little old lady huddled in, um, checking her apps on the cell phone. In fact, there was, m not minimal, but there was relatively low phone use of mobile phones. Anybody can guess why there was less mobile? They, they owned them. The screen is too small, and what else is too small? Oh, typing. Typing's too small. This, I mean, I w I'm a great touch typist on a real keyboard, but I screw up on these mobile stuff. And I'm only one-handed. How many people here are two-handed? You're two-handed on, on the phone? You can be. Well, OK. What? OK. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's awesome. Uh, learned something about my wife. It's, it's always nice to know. By the way, why has awesome become the substitute for OK? In, in Tucson, I ordered scrambled eggs yesterday, and I was told that was awesome. By Congratulations, the, inflation. Congratulations. So what do, you, what do you do when something is more awesome than awesome? Okay, so what are we finding with old folks? And old folks are defined in, for us as 65 plus. One is, I get kind of, I, I didn't come into this from the gerontology establishment. I've never gone to the gerontology conference. I'd like to, but uh, I can't afford to keep going to every conference. But one thing I think a lot of people forget is we weren't born old. So studying 65 plus is, Joe, can I say you're over 65? Yeah, you can say it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Joe wasn't always 65. Uh, and whatever we learned, which was probably using a key punch in my case, in Bev Wellman's case, and possibly in Joe's case, you know, we, we, we grow up with our skills. And so a lot of this vaulting, you know that sociology term, right, uh, about old people not being on the internet, younger people are getting to be old, for better or worse. We heard bad news from a friend today. 
on our mobile phones as we woke up, but people know what to do on the thing instead of getting into it. Secondly, um, and, and when we broke down older adults, in, I'm not, that, that's in a published paper, I'm not getting to it here, into those 75 or younger uh, to 65 and those older, we found that the, the younger older adults, if I can use that term, were a lot more active uh, than the older older adults. Now part of that might be enforced decrepitude. As people get older, their finger, the fingers get more uh, arthritic and they can't use it, but part of that could be uh, what you know about what you get into. Why are people using it if they're older adults? One, they're being lured into it. Um, they're especially grandchildren, you know, they, they, their children say, you gotta look at the grandchildren's picture. Or they're being forced into it. They want to find out when the movie's playing. Um, they pretty well need to go online. The third thing we found is they're worried about themselves falling down or getting in a car accident and nobody know about it, or their best friends or relatives doing that kind of thing. So um, there's a lot of concern for personal safety of, of themselves or others. We also find there was not a homogenous category. I don't, is this readable from the back? Um, there are only 10% of the old people. I mean, these are very low percentages, only four people. Uh, he's, he's young, he can sit on the floor. He can sit on the floor. Okay. Uh, but we found the, you know, we found low percentage of really savvy people. That's the upper right hand corner and non-users, but people had different sets of skills. Uh, they tend to use a few things. Some, like uh, one of our very good friends, plunges into everything and then we have to run up and help her um, deal with the frozen screen that, that results. So there's a lot of variation. We have a paper on deconstructing the digital divide that goes into this uh, pretty well. Um, pretty well said these kinds of things pretty well. So I'll just go on. And when we did it in 2014, they used phones as phones, which is now surprising because most people use phones as texting devices or map finders and stuff uh, like that. They never heard of things like Instagram, Snapchat. They vaguely heard of Twitter because it was trendy. Uh, they were more active, I guess I left out the word more, with dispersed friends than with Ken. Ken and something just hidden in the bottom that may not show up is we found a lot, digital literacy has become a new skill and a new form of social support. It's just like we run upstairs to help our best friend when, my God, Outlook has frozen on me. She doesn't know what Outlook is. That thing has frozen on me. Uh, can you unfreeze it? So that, that's become a skill set and a relationship set uh, going on. So what do we got? We got a lot of intergenerational communication. Um, a lot of it is help. I can't, I'm stuck on the computer. People talk as obviously all around. Um, one of our good friends has relatives in Portugal. They're Skyping weekly uh, to each other. We found that the same social support categories that we used in the second East York study, uh, that's, I guess it's still my most cited paper, Different Strokes from Different Folks with Scott Wortley, is still, the categories still work. A lot of use for companionship, a lot of use for emotional aid, uh, and arranging uh, some sort of physical aid. Helen Wang and I, and a couple other people have a paper on this. So, in short, old people have joined digital media, um, but not a, all of them are networked individuals. Uh, Helen Wang and I and Alice Zhang did a, a study on that, but we don't know if this will continue over time. As they get, we, as they get more involved with computers, we don't know what's going to happen as people change, and I frankly don't have any grant money to do it. We felt a lot of inferiority complex. They felt they were certainly almost universally not as good as their, as, as the, as their children, their younger friends, or their grandchildren. 
But even compared with their peers, everybody felt insecure um, going on. And then we decided to look compared to different age groups. Now look at these ends. They're really small. I don't, these are indicative findings in, you know, that's life. Um, but I think they're fascinating findings. Um, everybody uses the same device to some extent. They're very much less tablet use than you would think um, from media reports on tablet use going on there. And certainly less skills going on. Um, if you notice the 65 plus only use about 1.8 or slightly less than two, two types of digital activities. And it, it's a pretty clear age gradient. And that shows up in the kind of networks. That red doesn't show up very well, does it? But you can get the trend line. Um, all the people have more social ties. We, we did the standard kind of network stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, younger people have more social ties uh, than older folks. And we did, these were crude estimates. Uh, we didn't do the very detailed stuff that those of us who've done social networks no, because it just would take too long. But we asked the number of ties in different age groups. And, and this, is, of course, you'll never, you know, you can spend your life studying this. But the kind of relationships change over time. Um, it shrinks with old age. And um, neighbors and friends are particularly important in young age. And relatives and stuff in older age. On the other hand, to my surprise, number of, well, two, two surprises. One, the number of groups that people belong to, these are formally organized groups, are low. One or two, but the older folks are the ones who are in two or more. Once again, we don't have longitudinal data, so we don't know if they've always been in more groups or they tend to hang out more when they go on. I don't want to I mean, that's twice as much, but it's only two versus one. Uh, then we did a diversity thing uh, for the different kinds of networks that people are in, the kind of foci they are involved in for using Scott Feld's thing. And there's a slight decline in old age, but once again, we don't know if it's a decline. Is it a cohort effect or a longitudinal effect uh, going on? And people are using fewer communication channels. This includes face-to-face -face and traditional phone, and that, that's digital only. But the, basically, the trend is kind of the same. So we have a, a cohort effect going on here. Um, we think in that as people from the old days are using what they did. They conserved media. They knew how to pick up a phone and use it. That's what they're doing. They may have learned to type and therefore use email, but they're not branching out into many different kinds of situations. I'm actually going too fast. Wow. Yeah. I don't even, yeah, ah, this is too complicated. So comparing all adults, uh, younger adults have more ties. They have those over the age of 55 are, are, have fewer friends. Kinship ties lower with age as folks die off. Uh, older adults belong somewhat to more group and fewer communication channels. And by contrast, we have uh, Nello Honda, typical East Yorker. Um, and she's a writer and a comedian also. Uh, and this was a semi-posed, wasn't, she was sitting at a coffee shop with all that stuff around her. So I just rearranged it. And uh, she's very happy for them to use it. This photo is about six years old. So it has, anybody spot the obsolescent stuff there? What, what do you see, Catherine? Well, the Blackberry. Blackberry. Oh, I Actually, I see a few. Remember, it was a Canadian invention. So some of us oh, are right. loyal. <laughs> yeah. And she still has a camera out. Nobody carries a camera these days, except if maybe a visitor from across the Pacific. Uh, and an analog watch, well, I guess, possibly. And an iPod. Who carry, anybody carry a spe separate iPod? Yeah. 
iPod. I'm sorry? I miss my iPod. You miss it? <laughs> well, it, it misses you, so why don't it you does. recharge it and use it? <laughs> so we decided really to get to the guts of this talk, which was to measure how many of the people we studied, of the 101 people, were networked individual. So first, we, we counted the number of different kinds of ties they were involved in using a pretty standard set of relationships. Friends is always the hardest one to deal with. Uh, how many groups? How many organized groups? Church groups being the most prevalent. And we combined them. And then we kind of came up with three categories. Um, are they networked? Are they involved in a lot of diverse groups? Are they bounded? They have a lot of ties, but they're only in one or two. Or are they what we used to call isolates, but maybe that's too heavy a thing. Uh, so we call them socially limited. And much to my surprise, and maybe it's an artifact of the numbers, is it broke about one third in each. You know, I expected to see the great majority of people looking like socially networked uh, individuals. But a lot of people are in what we might have called traditional community. Now, I'd love to do a Trump versus Clinton kind of analysis on who was where, the kind of thing Arlie Huffshield hinted at, I think, in her Strangers in Their Own Land kind of book. But that might be one possibility for the people called socially bounded. We're still looking for a new title, but I think that's the one we're most comfortable with. Um, in some of our papers, we used a slightly different title uh, going on, and still a fair amount of reasonably isolated individuals, limited. So what do we have? First of all, we did an age group comparison. Um, this is coming out in a paper that will be in network science eventually. Uh, we still have to do some minor revisions. We didn't find much variation until the age 65. Once again, caution of our small sample. And then we said, is it age or digital media that is doing these kinds of things? If I had two screens, I'd put up the next slide at the same time. And we found both were important. That younger adults under the age of 35 and really under the age of 65, much more likely, no, under the age of 35, I'll, stick, I'll qualify that, were much more likely to be networked individuals. Uh, none of them were socially limited by our definition. And it, it just changed over time. Let me just flash forward to the next slide just to show you that. You can see that this, this trend line is per percent networked individuals, and this trend line is percent socially limited folks. And the pattern really changes at the extremes, especially, but even by the 50-year-olds uh, going on there. I think I'll go back. So 77% of high digital media users were networked individuals. By contrast, only 18% of medium and low media users uh, were networked individuals. So there's a relationship going on there. And we don't know causality. Is it that high media use facilitates being a networked individuals, or networked individuals seek out uh, high media use? The profiles f were similar for older adults, but a lower percentage of them were networked individuals. So once again, we wonder about a cohort versus longitudinal effect. I guess this is sort of wrapping up what the same thing, so I'll go on. This is my first time giving the talk, so there are a few crudenesses going on here. Um, so what are we finding? We're finding, I, I'm much more comfortable talking about networked individuals than I am talking about the socially bounded, because I know them. So I think, I know I'm tilting in that direction going on there. But there's been a reorganization of communication pretty clearly when we talk in the interviews and you get the quotes. Um, communication is both replacing travel, people talk, but it's driving travel. I'm here. Bev's here. Uh, we, we arrange these trips together, just like we had some friends coming down 
uh, from Las Vegas uh, last week and some other friends coming down from UT Austin in the middle of March. Somebody, I think you know Wen Hong Chen, some of you, so if she's coming on to visit. Um, we still find specialized ties. I didn't go into that, but uh, we have a paper on that in that people are using certain, and just like before the internet, certain ties are being used for emotional support or companionship, discussion partners, companionship, or service arrangements. And we find that when people are networked individuals, they have to calculate where they can get help, they have to think about it. They have more transitory ties than in the past, and they sort of weakly connect them, as I do with some people here in Arizona. We don't see each other much, but then we are in contact in multiple ways, and we can pick up where we left off from before. So there's some turnover going on. So people aren't bowling alone, they're bowling in networks. Many of them have sparsely knit clusters, some don't. People must manage their network with less obvious membership in a single group. Those who are networked individual uh, don't have much security, but they have more maneuverability, and especially when they get in trouble with a particular group. And just a general kind of thoughts, this really comes out of stuff that Lee Rainey and I did um, years ago, is now we reveal our inner thoughts in daily lives to a wider audience. We document a lot on Facebook, on Instagram. Anybody use Snapchat? Is Snapchat still around? Instagrammers? Really? A bunch of, because Instagram's really, Facebookers? Just a few? What am I leaving out? Twitter. Twitter. Oh, yeah. I used to be on, I'm, I still, I serialized my book on Twitter, although I, I left off when I came to Arizona. WeChat. Yeah. The problem with WeChat, of course, is, what is surveillance with the uh, Chinese government having total access to your files. Just, if you didn't, I'm, I'm sorry, sir? Well, we can assume that. Yeah. I think we can. I mean, look, any government can probably get access to any files, but I think the probability of Chinese government, mainland Chinese government, getting access to WeChat files is higher than the US government reading all your emails or stuff like that. Yeah. Did I leave out some means of communication? Skype? Hi, Skype. Yeah. Those of us who have friends and relatives, bro, what? What's up? Like What's up? Replacing yeah. Well, I, I just assume we all text message and stuff like that. That's right. But uh, I think the diff at least in my experience, the difference is you can do it internationally with online communication mm -hmm. rather than just text messaging. So if there are people that this, mm -hmm. um, this audience is like connecting across countries, yeah. And one problem, I'll probably say it in the slide somewhere, is things like Facebook assume you're one big happy community. Mm -hmm. I mean, Google tried with Google Plus to break that down into small worlds. It didn't really work very well. And that's not really true. Facebook's trying to, to multiplex it, but not, not working uh, really well. As the gentleman back there said, we don't know about privacy, but we just, most people don't worry about it very much. And then you suddenly get caught and your tweets from 10 years ago come back uh, to haunt you. So to summarize the debates, is the triple revolution destroying community? No. Once again, we don't have longitudinal data. Is it replacing in-person with online community? Only to, did you, were you raising your hand, Karen? Uh, slightly, people are, are communicating more this way but um, they're certainly seeing each other in person a fair amount. It's really supplementing community and transforming it so it's geographically more widespread. Uh, it's not destroying neighboring. Uh, people still need to borrow physical things from each other. They still have chance encounters when they take out the garbage, but it's making our iPhones 
have become in some ways the new neighborhood with people talking. And something I didn't go into today, but Tracy Kennedy, Kennedy and I have done some fair work on that. Uh, it's not disconnecting household members, but it's really transforming them as almost most families that have two household adults go out to work, they communicate a lot more than the days of, say, Mad Men. Remember Mad Men, where the w women would sit home and leave lives of quiet desperation with a lot of alcohol? A lot of good Japanese evidence on, on, on that kind of behavior, too. So people are more connected. Uh, who, has, who, has, who has given a, I, uh, a phone to a young child or to any child before the age of teen? Anybody? Those of you with children? What, how old? Is this your 10 year old? Yeah. Okay. And what, he got it last year? Yeah. And do you have location tracking on it? So you know where he is? You sure? Yeah. Okay. So when we did a study about six years ago, the mean age was. 13 for getting a phone in Toronto. All right, sorry, it's Canada-wide data, but I think it's gone way down uh, since then because phones have become the new pacifier uh, for little kids and stuff like that. So it's an evolving story. Uh, instead of replacing everyday pursuits, digital media are interwoven parts of everyday lives. But as we take it for granted, just like we take telephones for granted, 20 years ago, I tried like hard to get research grants to study the telephone, and I couldn't get anybody to fund me, not even the phone companies. They said, oh, we're into the future. Um, but as it became more perversive and varied, things like the reconfiguration towards networked individualism becomes important. So it's something worth thinking about. Um, here's all the papers, once again, they're on my key. I can, you can copy this whole talk. Joe has a copy already. Catherine does too. You may not know it, but I sent it to you late last night when I finished it. Uh, Flog the book, my co-author, the wonderful Lee Rainey. Um, for, since 2000, I guess it's 18 years now, he has put out at least one survey a month. Always honorable, always honest. Um, can't do any political stuff. We did this book called Networked, which I'm still very proud of. Look at that beautiful cover. None of these. The trick, anybody writing a book or trying to get it published? I will give you free advice for only 1% of your royalties. Nobody's doing a book? <laughs> Work like hell to get it labeled as a trade book instead of an academic book. Look at the bloody price. 16 bucks. Well, that's current Amazon price as of about two days ago. Came out originally listed for 30, but Amazon shoved it down to 20. As a trade book, stuff is cheaper. It is better copy edited. We went through a lot of hoops with the copy editor, and you get a fancier cover. And sometimes better distribution. And then the last slide, maybe I should have put this up front. These are the folks that I've worked with. That's me, Professor Annabel Kwanhasa, is at the University of Western Ontario. Um, just became a full professor. Molly is her student, and she'll be on the job market in the year, and she's wonderful. Helen Wang is uh, went, born in mainland, went to uh, Annenberg West in, in LA, and is now uh, doing a lot of stuff on gaming and also studying the international rescue uh, rescue or Refugee Committee, I forgot the exact name, on, on health communication. Alice Wang, Zhang, also from mainland China, originally masters at Chinese U of Hong Kong, um, works especially with me, and she'll be on the job market next year. And that's just our little logo. Uh, there are other teams doing some other stuff. So thanks a lot, um, and I'll be happy to take questions as long as we can.